in describing the <coughs> the state of the believer in this world before the next Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says awa man kana maytan fa ahyaynahu wa ja'alna lahu nuran kam yamshi bihi fi an-nas kama mathaluhu fi al-dhulumat laysa bi kharij minha he says, can they ever be compared with each other? It's such a stark contrast, Allah is saying. Can they ever be compared the one that was dead because of their disbelief, because of their rejection of God, and then we gave them life. The believer is alive. And we granted him a light, and our khutbah will be around this phrase, inshaAllah. And we granted him a light with which he walks among the people. Can he ever equate, can she ever equate the believer that is alive and enlightened? Like men methaluhu fi dhulumat, like the one that is stumbling around in the darkness, incapable of emerging from it, not to escape it. And so the believer here, Allah Azza wa Jal reminds us that he has unique qualities, has a unique state of mind, a unique state of heart, unique perspective. They walk the earth like everyone else, but in a sense, they see the world using the light of God. And the light that of human eyesight, what we can see, the perspective with which we see with our eyesight, compared to what Allah endows and grants a believer to see with their insight, with their hearts, with their faith and their conviction, is like the example of a candlelight versus the sun. They can't be compared, Allah is saying. The believer sees with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He notices above all the hand of Allah azza wa jal in all things, involved in all things. And he is sensitive to the messages that Allah Azza wa Jal sends. And that is why elsewhere in the Quran he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna fi thalik, this which I'm preaching to you, teaching to you, reminding you of, inna fi thalik, in all of that, la ayatun, are many, many, many signs, lil mutawassimeen, for the mutawassimeen. And the mutawassimeen are those who catch things by their sima. Sima is like the, the insignia, the mark, that subtle logo that's placed on things to identify it. They're able to size things up and identify them by a, by a subtle hint because of how strong their insight is that their faith grants them. And that is also of the manifestations, what exists because of Allah's name, Al-Latif. One of Allah's most beautiful names is Al-Latif, the most subtle. And of what it means that he is the most subtle, not just that he knows the subtle intricacies, the overlook, the hidden, everything, perfect in his knowledge, even knowledge of the subtleties, but he's also subtle in his dealings. That he sends messages all the time, places signs everywhere, but in subtle ways. He himself showing up and the angels showing up, that's not a test for anyone. That's as clear as day. And that's why a person's faith will not count if they believe and say, now we believe on the day of judgment. Of course you do. The subtlety is gone. But this world was filled, every corner of it, with messages from him. But they're subtle. They, they are for people that are willing to pay heed, people that are willing to have this insight, people willing to be receptive. And if you are that believer, if you would just train yourself to be more receptive to Allah's messages, sensitive, they can make all the difference. Sometimes it is one message. If you catch it, it changes the course of your life and your afterlife. Like, you know, you think of <clears throat> the example of the woman that the Prophet ﷺ said she lived a life of sin. She sold her body and she ruined her life and the lives of so many people through the haram relations she would be involved in. And then one time, she's at a well, she's so thirsty, she's drinking, and then a dog comes licking the dirt around the well, the sand. She realizes he's being tormented by what I just felt. She empathized, she felt the suffering of the dog. The hadith actually gives you enough detail to make you stop and wonder. They say, the hadith says that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, she didn't just give the dog some water. 
she went down into the well. She couldn't pull it out. And then she couldn't drink it for the dog, and so she took off one of her shoes and fills her shoe with water. And then how are you going to climb out of the well if you're holding the shoe? So she puts the shoe in her mouth. She holds it, grips it with her teeth to be able to climb out of the well, and then she gives it to the dog. فَشَكَرَ اللَّهَ لَهَا أَوْ فَشَكَرَ اللَّهُ لَهَا Two different narrations. فَغَفْرَ لَهَا the dog was appreciative and Allah appreciated her act that the dog appreciated and so he forgave her for all her sins. The message that she caught here, why did she exert so much effort? She realized this could be an opportunity for me to make up for the past, right? An opportunity for forgiveness and it was. She realized not that there's a dog hungry here. She realized that Allah sent this dog for me. She caught the message. And sometimes Allah sends us messages that can save us from long periods of pain, anguish, trauma, periods, messages of healing, if you were to be receptive to them. You know, a perfect example of this at the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet wasallam not only saw the Muslims who prematurely celebrated the victory and then got massacred, it wasn't just that. His own uncle, his dearest uncle Hamza radiallahu an, was massacred and gored at Uhud. And that is why Hamza ibn, Abd, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the man about which they said, we never saw the Prophet cry. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the way he cried so intensely, the way he cried over Hamza. But what happened on the way back from Uhud? This is no coincidence. <laughs> Allah had waiting for him on the road back to Medina one of the most uplifting messages ever. One of the most therapeutic and healing messages you can ever hear from a created being. There was a woman from Banu Dinar. She came out with the army incoming, returning home, and they said to her, don't look. Your husband's not in the army. He's done. He, he was killed. He was martyred. She said, where is the messenger of Allah? They said, and your brother has also been killed. And your father has been killed. Or they said, her son. Three men from her family, back to back to back. Their and af after each time, they break this devastating news to her. She says, but where is the messenger of Allah? Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. His love dominated everything in her heart. And they said, she, he is fine. She said, I have to see him. She could not be at ease until she saw him with her own two eyes. They bring her to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she sees him and she says to him, Kullu musibatin ba'daka jalal. Ya Rasulallah, every calamity that can ever afflict me in life after I know that you're okay is light, is bearable. I can handle it. So long as you're okay, Ya Rasulallah. On the day he was hurting so much from Hamza, Allah sends him this woman to say these words to him. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then there are opportunities, messages brought our way to fix things while we still can. You know, I was recently rereading re much of the, or parts of the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. He was always so receptive of how big this little moment could be that Allah sent my way. He saw it as a divine message. He saw it as divine intervention. Allah's hand at work. One time when he went to visit the lands of Khaybar, these were all during his Khilafah, they were all napping, the midday nap, because the sun is like scorching in the deserts at that hour. And a woman's like rubbing, grabs his foot and like wakes him up. And he says to her, like, who are you? What do you want? She picks him of all people. And she says, Tawassamtu fik al khayr, you look like a good guy. I don't know why I picked you. She doesn't know he's Umar. <laughs> I, you're a good guy. And the Khalifa, Umar, she doesn't know it's him, sent us a man last year named Muhammad ibn Maslama. He wasn't a good man. He, he was told to give basically allowances, to give a stipend to every person, and he didn't give me. Can you come with me so we can talk to him? Because, you know, I can't speak to him myself. So he turns around to people next to him and says, go get Muhammad ibn Maslama. She says, no, no, no way, no way. This is the governor. I meant for you to come with me. He said, if he doesn't come, I'll go with you. 
And they go and they bring Muhammad ibn Maslam, radiallahu anhu, who's a great Sahabi. And he says to him, yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen, O Khalifa, what's going on? The woman here is O Khalifa. She's blown away. The narrator says she kind of like tucks herself in her clothes of how embarrassed she was that she was talking to Umar like this, waking him up from his siesta nap and all this. So he says to him, this woman is saying X, Y, and Z. He said, I, uh, I never saw this woman before. He said, before Islam, we were nobodies. The moment Allah gives us some territories, we're going to forget about the quote-unquote little people. He said, oh Umar, for sure I did not withhold from her. It could have been an oversight or she didn't come to receive it. He said to him, you go back and the next time around, you're collecting zakah and redistributing, you give her for last year and you give her for this year. <laughs> he does this thorough about an isolated case. Why? Because he sees that this is Allah's message to me. I can fix this. Or another example, there was a caravan that came all the way to Medina of very wealthy traders. And he felt the amount of money they were carrying is tempting. So he said to Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and himself, guard with me this, have them stay in the masjid and we will personally guard it to make sure nobody steals anything until the morning. And so while he's standing up awake all night, he hears a woman or Abdul Rahman ibn Auf hears a woman whose baby continues to cry. And they say, be good to your baby, fear Allah. And the baby continues to cry. And they say to her, what is wrong with you? What a horrible mother, your baby's crying all night. What's wrong with you? She said, what is wrong with you? You've been annoying me all night. I'm trying to wean my baby. I'm trying to get my baby to stop suckling. Because Umar ibn al-Khattab only gives money to people. They, she doesn't know he's Umar. <laughs> gives money to people when the baby stops nursing and starts eating real food. So he needs a real budget. They say, Umar, that morning, nobody could understand anything he was reciting at Fajr because of how hard he was crying from regrets. And he, after Fajr, he turned around and he said, send message to all the Muslim lands to not rush weaning your children. Umar has killed enough Muslim children. He felt like it was his mistake and now he could fix it. And every newborn now has an allowance, has a budget that goes to them, whether they're nursing or whether they're eating. And in a third and final incident, I'll mention to you very quickly. Zayd ibn Aslam said Umar started going around at night, checking up on people. And he found another woman. <clears throat> Her fire was lit at night in an odd area. Something was wrong. Something was off. And they said to her, what are you cooking? She said, I'm not cooking anything. I'm boiling water so my kids think I'm cooking so that they can uh, go to sleep already. We have no food. And may Allah get my vengeance against Umar ibn Khattab. He said, but Umar ibn Khattab, how do you know he knows about you? She said, how can he be my leader if he doesn't know about me? And so Umar runs off with Zayd ibn Aslam, rahimahullah. He carries the wheat and some like ghee or shortening, whatever he could grab from the repositories, from storage. And he brings it over to her and he doesn't let Zayd carry it. He carries it on his own back. Zayd says, I was sitting there watching and he's going under the kettle and he's blowing into the fire to stoke it. And the smoke is coming out from between the hairs of his beard. And I'm like, this is, the, this is the Khalifa. This is the president of the Muslims. And then the woman says to him in the end, you know, God sent you to me. And you are far more deserving of being our Amir, our leader than Umar is. Because you know about us. You care about us. And so she felt he was sent for her. And he believed that as well. This is why he acted this way. We all have this stuff in our life. All of us. When you see someone that is frustrated that they can't build a family, that's a message for you to be more grateful for the family you have. When you see how quickly someone just like you or healthier than you or younger than you just gets sick or passes away, you stop becoming of those if you're receptive to the masjid that are cheated. As the Prophet ﷺ said, free time and health are two blessings most people get cheated for. They don't see the messages. They are treasures everywhere, but they are subtle. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله and Allah تبارك وتعالى finally in the Quran tells us those who don't heed the wake up calls that come their way 
that are screaming at them if they were just to unmute their ears, to be more perceptive, be more receptive, be more sensitive, they will be the ones that will be screaming on the Day of Judgment. <coughs> he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a very powerful ayah, وَهُمْ يَصْطَرِخُونَ فِيهَا In the punishment, they will be screaming therein. رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّا نَعْمَلْ Bring us out, pull us out so we can do good deeds other than the deeds we used to do. Allah says what about subtle messages? Didn't we allow you to live long enough that whoever will pay attention would have paid attention already? And the warner has already come to you. Many of the scholars said the warner intended in this ayah is not just the Prophet ﷺ. It's the warner in your personal lives, the people you cross paths with, the aches and pains in your joints and in your bones, the white hairs that come, the burial of our relatives, our loved ones, our community members. This is the nadir in your personal life. As Allah says, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ Even within your own selves, there are signs. أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ Will you not just look at them, see them for what they are? So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us people of perception that see his signs clearly and people of audition who hear his messages clearly and make the best out of these treasures that will change our lives into better courses insha'Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us capitalize on what is remaining of our life and make that a reason for whatever has passed to be forgiven. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those that have the least regrets on the Day of Judgment and those that believe in Him being the most subtle and rely on His subtle messages coming to us when we don't go looking for them. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Allahumma khfil lana warhamna. Allahumma khfil lana warhamna. Allahumma khfil lana warhamna. Ishfi mardana wa marda al-Muslimin. Wa afi mubtalana wa mubtala al-Muslimin. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.